Hi folks, we're back, cutting through the matrix, this big strange system we're born into, where your parents take everything for granted because they were brainwashed before you were, and their job is to partly brainwash you and make you think that everything's normal as well, and most folk actually will. If a mammals, if the adult mammals don't train their children what to be aware of, the young ones are easy prey to the predators around, and my goodness, we have lots of predators in this society, and they run the world actually. And they don't simply act as simple predators, they use sciences as well to prey on you because they understand how we tick. The biggest amount of financing that's really gone into uh, humanity and the study of humanity has gone into how your mind ticks and how the groups work together and how nations work together, how to create cultures and destroy cultures. And in other words, if you find what creates a culture and what makes it strong, you find ways to destroy it. And uh, that's what they've been up to for an awful long time. Uh, the group who will run the world and bring you the wonderful United Nations, they had to destroy the cultures by degrading them step by step through we- means they would actually enjoy at the time. And they give you the culture industry and everybody copies and, copies and mimics what they see, something that even Plato knew an awful long time ago. And you have no idea of the, the amount of your tax money goes in to these projects to make sure that you're brainwashed in the proper way, the proper way, for the proper way that the authorities want you to behave at any given period. Sometimes they'll take a society down and they'll point out the chaos of the producers. Say, my goodness, look at the crime, the unwanted children, the, the drugs, the prostitution, the crime. And then they, they get the, the police force in and then they, they change more laws to have more authority over you. You can't have that in a society where the culture is intact. In fact, you don't need most of the cops either. Everyone knows the basic rules. And you please yourselves. That's how it used to be not too long ago. And people don't know, too, that before uh, World War II began, a group came from Germany and from, from Vienna, too, from the Vienna School. And they had combined a couple of their doctrines to do with a, a form of Marxism, which they hoped to bring into the world and run men properly, the way they should be organized. And they would dictate from the top down you know, having, having the proper intelligentsia do it to make sure everyone behaved in the proper, proper way and be, they'd be ruled like a big machine, you see. But more so than that, they would also work right down to how many people should be born for any given function. Uh, no more free choice in anything. It was just so untidy when you were decided, I, I think I'll try to work at this and I might not like it, I'll try something else. That was just too untidy. They wanted to pick you at school find out what you had an ability for and train you solely in that ability. And that's all you'd know. You would know nothing about any other science, in fact, or any any other particular area. That's what the Soviets did. So they came over, as I say, to escape Germany. It was coming into World War II. And they were put up by Britain and the United States and given incredible funding from the international bankers and foundations to set up their vast projects. And here is one of them here. It was called the Radio Project. And we know that Britain, when it started up the BBC, uh, tested out Tavistock uh, techniques on the general population to see if they could alter their behavior. Remember what Skinner found out too. You put something in the people's environment and it will alter their behavior. The radio was one. The television followed it. Because people want to come home at a certain time and everybody shuts up and says nothing as that particular show is airing. And they usually left you with serials, so you'd have a cliffhanger at the end, and then they would find out how many folk would tune in the next day. They'd altered your behavior. They'd altered what you would be doing otherwise if you weren't tuning in to listen to this episode. And they also aimed primarily, again, at women. They thought women are far more adventurous when it comes to change They'll go for it faster than men. So this project here is about the U.S. They use one on the United States, too, in league with Tavistock, of course. And it's called Radio Project. As says, Radio Project was a social research project funded by, guess who again, the Rockefeller Foundation, to look into the effects of mass media on society. In 1937, the Rockefeller Foundation started funding research to find the effects of new forms of mass media on society, especially radio. Several universities joined up at a headquarters was formed at the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. That was also part of the psychology department. The following people were involved. Here's the old names again. 
Paul Lazarus, director of the Radio Project, Theodore Adorno. These guys all had CIM. It was actually OSS clearance, by the way. Theodore Adorno, a massive player in all of this. He ended up running a big part of the culture industry, designing, along with Bertrand Russell and the Macy Group, uh, the kind of culture they'd bring in the 50s and in the 60s. In fact, he owned a lot of the rights of various groups uh, for their music, and it's often said that he wrote a lot of it. Anyway, it says here, Theodorno, uh, who was chief of the music division, uh, Handley uh, Cantrell, a psychologist at Princeton University's Department of Psychology, Gordon Allport, another of Lazar Field's assistants, went on to be the Tavistock Institute's leading representative in the United States. Frank Stanton, researcher from CBS, sent to help the project, went on to become president of CBS. Amongst the project's first studies were soap operas, this is back in the 30s, known as radio dramas at the time. They were doing what Britain had already tried out with Tavistock. The radio project was researched in the 1930 Halloween broadcast of The War of the Worlds. That's where they used Orson Welles to, to narrate it over the radio to make it sound like it was actually happening, and they panicked lots of people. It says they found that the estimated 6 million people who heard this broadcast, 25% thought it was real. Most of the people who panicked did not think it was an invasion from Mars that was occurring, but rather an invasion by the Germans. They're trying to see how, much the, how well their propaganda worked, hyping up the public, you see. It was later determined that because the radio broadcasts from the Munich crisis earlier in the year, the masses were more prone to this. The third research project was that of listening habits. Because of this, a new method was developed used to survey an audience. This was dubbed the Little Annie Project. The official name was the Stanton Lazar Field Program Analyzer. This allowed not one uh, only to find out if a listener liked performance, but how they felt at any individual moment through a dial which they could turn to express their preference, positive or negative. This has become uh, since an essential tool in focus group research. And I've gone through focus research groups with Bernays before. Uh, Theodore Adorno produced numerous reports on the effects of atomized listening, which radio supported and of which he was highly critical. However, because of profound methodological disagreements with Lazarfield over the use of techniques like listener surveys and Little Annie, Adorno thought both grossly simplified and ignored the degree to which expressed taste would result of commercial marketing. Adorno left the project in 1941. That's when he went on to join the Macy Group that was authorized by the president to change the culture of the United States, by the way. Uh, when they combined with the Macy Group, the old Vienna Club, and also with um, the group that came over from, uh, Ger- another group that came over from Germany. They put them all together and gave them massive funding to control and alter the U.S., using again funding from the government and from the foundations, Rockefeller being a massive investor in this big project. They have never stopped, by the way. Never stopped. And they, they used the universities, even that one with War of the Worlds, they used the whole psychological department of Princeton University and, and departments from the, from the war department as well were involved in it to see what the, how they could vastly manipulate whole populations uh, in this fashion. Quite something, isn't it? And folk haven't got a clue what's going on. Now, I touched on this the other day, just touched on it, didn't go through it. And it's about persuas- persuasive technology. Because, you see, everything you, you do now uh, is, is really a method of prompting. They're prompting you, those that sell you the various um, computers and iPhones and everything else to do with it, uh, actually hire people to find ways to prompt you. I've gone through Sunstein and his uh, prompting uh, techniques, and he's one of the big leaders in it. But this here is from a, a company, uh, uh, but it's co-produced by UBM Tech Web or, and O'Reilly Conferences, it says. And this was on the, the Web 2 Expo San Francisco 2010. So it was a big workshop for all the big players. And it says it was taught by Kendra Markle, and it as fo- breaks down as follows. And she gives you the intros. It says, intro, tools and techniques for persuading people quickly and inexpensively are here. The platforms for persuasions are open even to those with limited technical skill. We cover examples of persuasion on websites, how to persuade folk through what they're reading, mobile applications, texting, Facebook, video games, and reflect on the trends and upcoming opportunities we see at the time of the workshop. 
And the, the next part is brain science. That's neuroscience. Our brains are wired to stereotype. Follow the crowd, learn from example, react to triggers, etc. With careful design, our technology can act like and exhibit appropriate traits to persuade our brains and influence our attitudes and actions. For example, technology that volunteers personal information before asking for the user information is likely to be more successful in, in obtaining it. They've got you covered every different way. They, they know you down to a, through Z, A to Z. Messages intended to stop the user from doing something are, are more effective when accompanied by a picture of a person of the same gender. We, we talked briefly about why these associations exist in our brains and lead up how they translate into web development. Persuasive techniques. We'll describe at least five of those broadly applicable principles of persuasive technology and the pros and cons of each. These include tailoring experience, surveillance, operant conditioning. I hope you've all read into operant conditioning. Reduction, tunneling, and self-monitoring, amongst others. Self-monitoring, by the way, is also called self-policing. And that's what the UN is always harping on about through their political correctness. Uh, they'll bring in a society who will be, who will be very politically correct and they'll be self-policing because they'll be scared stiff. They're being watched or that someone could even read your thoughts. No kidding. Self-monitoring and others. And I'll, and I'll go on through some more of this stuff when I come back from this break. Hi folks, we're back and we're cutting through the matrix, just going through an article here from the Expo San Francisco 2010 from Web2 it was called. It was a big expo, it was on there for all the big players who are currently and will be in the future playing with your head because that's their job, you see, to make you do things, alter your behavior. Politicians actually pay the money too to find ways to alter your behavior and it's through your computers, it'll getting prompts and all the rest of it. And shortly you'll see built into all, the, all your emails, little pop-ups will come up when you are politically incorrect and you'll be asked in a nice voice, I'm sure, do you really want to carry on uh, with this? This is politically incorrect. This could be charged. You could make, be fined two credits or five credits or something like that. And I'm not kidding. This is what it's all about. But most of it, you see, works on you without you knowing about it at all because they don't tell you what they're doing. It's called prompting, etc. And leading your, your wave of thinking. They understand you. And they categorize you into a whole bunch, over 30 different types. And it said here that... Um, it says, we'll talk about technology and, and how each of these can be persuasive for different types of behavior. We'll do a short exercise for each technique to give attendees a chance to apply the principle to their own work and keep people awake and learning from doing. It says, case studies. Here we'll delve into the strengths and weaknesses of existing persuasive platforms, such as mobile phones and Facebook, as well as some emerging platforms such as persuasive video. Persuasive, persuasive video. We'll look at good and bad examples of each and discuss ways that certain popular websites and services could be better influential. And it says we'll take participants a chance uh, or give them a chance to analyze an example of what we, what we provide with their neighbor to encourage them to think. Design process and exercises. Our eight-step design process starts with determining the exact behavior you are targeting. It could be anything in the general population. What behavior do you do not like or whatever? And understanding it with a grid of 35 behavior types. Next, choose a receptive audience and identify the barriers. Then choose the appropriate technological channel. Find relevant examples. Imitate successful examples. Test and iterate quickly. And lastly, expand on success. We'll also show a model for behavior change that involves using brain science, that's neuroscience, to increase motivation, remove barriers by breaking the behavior down into smaller, achievable pieces, and finally sparks action by sending a trigger. Then they show you more about that, how to do it at their website. 
Next, you'll apply those, this process as a group to a few potential applications, such as a virtual coach for a health uh, connect condition, a trustworthy website of resources, etc. We'll guide the audience through the design process, letting them decide on the features and platform for the application. Now, it says here, Kendera builds persuasive technology tools for healthy behavior change. This is a big player here, folks. I hope you're listening carefully. It says that she works with a persuasive technology lab at Stanford University on mobile persuasion and psychology of Facebook. <laughs> All you schmucks on Facebook. And social networking for health. She does research at Kaiser Permanent using technology tools to help patients manage obesity. See, they're tagging that too. And chronic conditions. Her, her company, uh, Alter Actions Org, produces tools for mental health, including recovering from depression, learning mindfulness, and synthesizing happiness, and building willpower, etc., 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 etc. Now, they're all using this. Governments are using this all the time in all their advertising, and the big marketers are using it all the time as well. And tie that in with Sunstein, remember, with his particular big units, very important units, who are doing a lot of stuff for the government, for schools, and for the general population to change everyone's behavior. And Sunstein also said they'd have to target the patriot communities by infiltration. Well, they have done that years ago, actually. They don't wait for them to start up. They often set up their own ones and call it patriot uh, uh, ones. And then they, of course, uh, change what a patriot even means anymore. And that's part of it. He said, we can diffuse any conflict before it starts because... He said um, we can integrate ourselves, infiltrate amongst them, and then gradually, uh, through argumentation and thought processes and alteration, um, they'll have no reason for being. They'll say, what's the point of doing what we're doing? They'll no longer believe in what they're doing. That's how you diffuse it. They've been at this for years, these characters. Years and years and years. Before they even gave you the computer, in fact. And people are utterly oblivious of it. Utterly oblivious of it. But they did say that they target other Patriot shows and so on, especially forums. It's so easy to implant them into the forums. The guy says all the right stuff. He seems to know more than most. People follow them, and then he ends up getting them to attack other people who are genuine. And that's what they do. They use the schmucks as the foot soldiers, and they attack the genuine Patriot sites, bombarding them with rotten emails and stuff like that. A lot of money is paid to these infiltrators to destroy uh, what's the truth being put out there. An awful lot. You know, at one time, and at least in the States, the people had the right of the individual. Because if you have no right as individuals, you have no rights at all. And the people would clamor up and get things done occasionally and scare the ones at the top once in a while when they got out of hand. The whole idea, and even the United Nations said this, that their worst enemy is individualism. It would have to be destroyed. And that's why the group that create the group mentality, who do nothing but tweet to each other and text to each other to see what they're all doing together. Anything but be an individual. Without individuality, you have nothing. You're conquered. You're given your political correct thoughts and everything else that you're supposed to do and think and say. How to speak, how to speak, how to behave, what to believe about any particular topic. Political correctness to the extreme, but no individuality. Then they use a whole group against you. Oh, you can't say that, that's this, that's that. There's always a slang name for it, they slur upon you, like, like treacle. They use power of the group. Now there's, um, there's Glenn in Philly there. Are you there, Glenn? Uh, yes, hello, Alan, I'm here. Yes. Good evening. Um, Good evening. Early in, early in the program, you were listing a bunch of uh, names of movers and shakers, and one of them was a Gold, Gordon Allport. Mm-hmm. And I remember writing a paper about that guy in college in one of my psych courses, and he's the one who had the theory about uh, the three different kind of body types, the endomorph, the ectomorph, and That's the mesomorph. Right. That's right. And the, yeah. the endomorph was basically like the the paunchy person, the ectomorph was a tall, tall skinny person, and the mesomorph right. was the, you know, um, chiseled, more muscular build. Mm-hmm. And I remember even taking issue with it at the time. I mean, I, I, I remember explicating, you know, all the details, and then, like, basically refuting. I mean, it seemed ridiculous and remarkably mm-hmm. narrow and everything. 
But at, at that time when I was in school, that was no longer specific, necessarily gospel, but it certainly had been for some time. Oh, psychiatry picked it up on, and classified people with mental illnesses with that physical description. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's just crazy. I mean, um, all you know, all ports. I, so how can people actually think this stuff's you know valid? And even mm-hmm. then, I knew you know that was crazy. That's right. Well, now they're into the deeper stuff now that came out of it. That really was a psychological testing of manipulation of vast groups of people. And they started with the students, too, to get them to be the, the new evangelists, to go into society and start teaching it to other young students to bring in this controlled society. But you're quite right, absolutely right, with their fraudulent findings. Yeah. And now they use all the consent of facilitation to mold everybody's opinion. Absolutely, absolutely. You're dead on. Yeah. But thanks for calling in. And from Hamish, myself, in Ontario, Canada, it's good night to me. Your God or your gods go with you.